The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Dateable Podcast, season 15, episode two. We're going. We're rolling along. I know this isn't necessarily one of our number one. F- okay, I don't want to say that. She is our number one fan. But my sister-in-law did reach out to me and said that we are content pumping machine, that she is so impressed by how much content we put out into the world and cannot wait to listen to season 15. I surely feel that way. I feel like <laughs> there's not a day that goes by without us creating some sort of content. <laughs> <laughs> We're content creators, as they would say in today's industry. <laughs> in today's world, yes. <laughs> it's a really fun place to be right now, I have to admit, to actually have a space for content creation that never used to be a career path or even a respectable career path. And now here we are amongst the YouTubers, the vloggers, the TikTokers. We're the podcasters, and it's I'm very happy that we can realize these creative dreams of ours. Yes, I was listening to a podcast. This is so meta. Listening to a podcast Mm -hmm. about podcasting. Uh And you're not just a podcaster, but you are a voice. And I Mm. think that is one of the things that I love the most about podcasting is that it gives us a voice. And, you know, UA, I feel like our mission has changed over time. When we first started, we were just freaking flat out confused about dating. That's (laughs) clearly was our motivation. But I feel like now we're kind of like, enough is enough. We need to help the movement to end yes. why modern dating sucks so bad. Basically, save modern dating. I feel like that is our mission, is how do we start to save modern dating that doesn't become this dreadful thing that people don't partake in and mm-hmm. ultimately doesn't give them the love lives that they truly do want. And go back on the word deserve, but I do believe everyone deserves happiness. And mm-hmm. it's so unfortunate you know, that we hear all these stories of just how derailed and discouraged people are. So I'm so happy this episode feels like such a breath of fresh air to help move towards that mission. We love our guest Meredith. We became friends on Instagram. So I guess in today's time, you just call that a friend, you know, even if you've never met IRL. (laughs) But we've interacted with her quite a bit on Instagram and saw the content that she was putting out and was like, yes, girl, we're on board with this. She's single, thriving, enjoying life, but reflecting on the topics we talk about here on Dateable. And so we thought it would be cool to reach out to her and see if she can talk about her dating experience at a time when we were looking for a first line dater reporter (laughs) so they could (laughs) tell us on the front lines of what are they doing when they're dating. Yeah, we had this idea of, you know, having this dater. But I feel like it wasn't a fully baked idea. We we're kind still of like, isn't. we need. it still isn't. Basically, that's what I'm <laughs> leading to is Meredith reached out. It was like, I would love to be that dater. And we decided to do a phone call. I did a screener call with her. And I remember immediately texting UA that this girl is freaking amazing. Mm-hmm. And I'm still not really sure what we're doing with this dater, but we should just get her on the podcast in the meantime until we figured it out. The, her energy reminds me of Cheryl's episode just say yes. yes very similar vibe and i think i believe whoever listens to this episode you're going to walk away just inspired and optimistic something i've been thinking about recently is there's so much bad dating behavior because we normalize it we give terms mm-hmm. to it the media loves covering it fucking like west elm caleb was all over the news but mm-hmm. someone who's actually doing something good in dating never makes the news right so i was thinking about like positive reinforcement how can we encourage daters to have more positive positive dating behavior. And with dogs, you give a treat. But with (laughs) humans, we love recognition and acknowledgement. So this idea that I was playing around with is, can we give them some sort of dateable badge? Or if you find someone doing something great in dating, we send them an email or a text saying, congrats, you're dateable or something like that. There's privacy issues because you can't be giving out people's phone numbers or their emails. (laughs) But help us brainstorm. What could this look like where we can help facilitate rewarding good dating 
eating behavior. So we get that positive reinforcement. I love this. And I really do believe that is part of the problem of why there's this perception that dating sucks and this perpetual misery that comes with it because all these dating terms are just so negative. It's all the behavior you don't want to happen. Ghosting, roaching, (laughs) breadcrumbing, zombieing, the list goes on and on. I think roaching still sticks out to me as the worst, but (laughs) all the stuff, the worst, all the stuff though it's never the positives. Or if there is a positive word, it doesn't stick. And I Mm -hmm. get it. Sometimes misery loves company. But I really do believe to save modern dating, we need to focus on the positive. I love in this episode, the way Meredith frames it, she definitely has not had, you know, the easiest dating life, nor has anyone. But instead of just getting discouraged, she looks at dating as growth. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because sometimes we think that, you know, other people just got a better hand than us. And that's the victim mentality. But she just takes ownership and she makes the path that works for her and Mm -hmm. enjoys the process. And I think that's so essential. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be rainbows and butterflies. I'm sure there's going to be days that are going to be hard. But the more we dwell on the negative, the more that just perpetuates. And related to that, here's a challenge for all of you who are dating right now. This is for you. So if you're driving, (laughs) just listen carefully. Don't hit anybody. But this is for you. Listen. Listen up. So many of you talk about how on first dates or second dates, you just talk shit about dating with the other person. Oh you ta- God, you yes. share experiences of bad dating behavior. You trauma dump on each other. And then you come out and say, oh, we have so much in common. We've had the same bad experiences online dating. It's a very cathartic feeling to share that misery like we were talking about. But it's also super draining. Can you imagine just talking about all the shit that's happened to you with someone else who's also had the same shit happen to them? What is the point of that. So next time you're on a date, if you end up going down that topic, just stop it. Just stop it. Say, you know what? We've all experienced bad dating behavior, but I truly believe that there's good dating behavior out there and it starts right now. So we're going to end that conversation (laughs) about bad dating. I love that. And we say that there are no rules in dating, but I do believe the one rule should be to never talk about how bad dating is on the first date. (laughs) Yes. And stop dating, just talking about your dating experiences with other people on a first no. date. You're there with someone. You're there else. to connect with that person. Yes. Yeah. I remember before I met my partner, I had one of the worst dates I've ever had. I remember mm. him asking me that if to go back to his house and I had to use the bathroom and I still was like, I, I can't because nope. I don't want <laughs> I'd rather to be my pants. spend any more time with you. But he basically spent the whole time talking about just how bad dating was. Mm. And then went into his ex and how bad their relationship was and how their sex life was bad and how their money situation bad. I'm like, I do not need to know any of this. And you have not asked me any questions about me and connecting with me. Why would that be a good date? That is the worst date you could possibly have. Yet so many people are having that date. It's just a default. It's easy to fall on. It's when you're fucking lazy, you can talk about the things that are top of mind. But if you're on a date, can you be more, can we be more mindful and think about, is this conversation draining or energizing? And if it's any ounce of draining, just stop the conversation. (laughs) It's not going to get any more energizing when you get to that drained topic. So let's just like regroup for a sec. Um, all of our daters out there. If you are listening to Datable, we know you're part of the crew. And if you're part of the crew, you know you're not going to be part of this behavior. So no more trauma dumping on bad dating behavior on first dates. And no more these negative talks about other dating experiences. It doesn't serve your current date or interaction. No. And we talk about with Meredith, if something's not serving you, just move on. There's no need to get that energy of how miserable it is. And it's, it's easy. I get it. I've definitely been there that you can just love to bitch with your friends and you love to complain about things, especially if it's not going your way. But I remember being like, I actually shouldn't be talking about dating with this friend anymore. Yes. Because it's I leave feeling de-energized. I feel leaving depressed about the situation. And that's not good energy to bring into a date. Yes. When Julie and I are out in the wild (laughs) and people find out that we do a dating podcast, the first thing they always want to do is tell us a dating story. And it's always a bad dating story, whether it happened to them or a friend. And we tend to just kind of not respond to that. Yeah, you can tell the story. But what is 
What is the purpose that you're serving here? Uh, we would much rather for you to come up and say, oh, you do a dating podcast? Yeah, I really, I dated someone who was so wonderful and this is what they did. You know, tell us about the good stuff. We already know about the bad stuff. You don't need to tell us that anymore. No more reminders oh, of that. Why is it that we're always drawn to the bad? It's so crazy when you think about it. <sighs> And when you're drawn to the bad, you start looking for the bad and the bad yeah. becomes part of your narrative. And then that becomes part of your story. And then you're like, oh, I'm doing it for the story. And then yes. every day you go on, all you want it to, is for it to go bad so you can go home and tell your friends what happened. So one of our pet peeves for now we're just like airing it. I guess this is maybe negative. Yeah, let's go. One let's of, go. Whatever. <laughs> I need to get this off my chest. This would bother me for a while. Please. The word red flag really bothers uh -huh. me. And I get yes. where it's coming from. I'm not saying that you should ignore any sign of someone being a bad partner for you. Absolutely not. But the way red flag is used is that everyone's like, oh, they ate for a second with their mouth open. Red flag. Yeah. They wore a band shirt from 10 years ago. Red flag. Like It's not yeah. things that matter at all. It's just humans being humans. And yeah. I guarantee we all have red flags. And and UA and I have been like, it's almost like the game Capture the Flag, that people are just constantly trying yeah. to go out there and capture that red flag. Yeah. Think about this. Uh, have you ever been at work and you work on a deck or something for your boss to review? All your boss's job is to give comments and feedback. And they're looking for flaws right? Yeah. That's what this red flag search is all about. All you're doing is looking for places where you can give feedback and give give criticism. That's not dating. You're not dating someone who's your boss. You're not handing over some work to them to review. Can we accept people for who they are? And instead of looking for all the flaws, because you wouldn't want someone to do that to you, no. <laughs> sitting there just being like, hmm, what are her red flags? How about we just look for the human connection? There's this basic human connection and it has no value to it. It's not positive or negative. It's a connection. I also feel like we make so many assumptions on red flags based on yeah. people's relationship history. And yeah. there's so many reasons why someone made a decision or got to the place that they got to that yeah. may or may not be like, just because it's not your experience doesn't mean it's bad or it's wrong. So yeah. I feel like we're finding red flags and things that just don't match what we are. But that's basically the opposite of connecting with another human being yeah. and learning to grow and see things in a different way. This red flag hunt has got to stop. Yes. Yes. Stop. Stop. Capture the red flag. Stop playing that game. It's not fun. It's not serving you. It's not doing anybody any good. But listen to this episode because this episode with Meredith will absolutely uplift you and make you feel more optimistic, not just about dating, but also about life. Just saying her name Meredith makes me happy, <laughs> makes me smile. So hopefully this episode will do the same for you after you're done. Yeah, I remember the whole time I was thinking, who could we set her up with? I know. Which honestly, you know, when we have guests that talk about just how dismal dating is or people that we've talked to in our community, that isn't what's going through your mind. So there is something yeah. really important of putting out that energy because your energy leaks through on every date. Absolutely. Oh, a thousand percent. I hated a capture the flag in elementary school and I hate <laughs> it now. <laughs> <laughs> that gave us such a bad connotation and it continues to with red flags. <laughs> Did you like dodgeball? I like dodgeball better than red flag. Oh, sorry, red flags. <laughs> I <laughs> like dodgeball better than capture the flag. Why? Capture the flag. Oh, my God. I think there's so many things. I just felt like I was forced to play capture the flag so many times. And then I was a camp counselor. And the guy that was in charge, like, purposely put us all on activities we didn't want to do. So I requested oh. arts and crafts and water related stuff. And he basically put me on capture the flag every time oh fuck him <laughs> he's a red flag <laughs> i always thought dodgeball was too violent yeah it scared me it hurt me <laughs> fun fact actually while we're on this topic this is so off topic that i actually got fired from being a cab counselor did i ever tell you this uh so, obviously not <laughs> this girl on in my bunk and i honestly don't even remember i wouldn't say it too for privacy reasons but i don't even remember what it was but she came to me in secrecy about something that was going on with her body 
And I went to the nurse and the same guy that made me be on Capture the Flag demanded that I told him and I refused to tell him because <gasps> he is like it's not, privacy. it's a privacy thing. And he was like a man and it wasn't who she would want to tell. And then I got fired for not t- telling him. Okay. <laughs> and What's I stand by that. <laughs> I stand by my decision 25 years later or whatever it was. <laughs> Have you looked up this guy recently? Well, I do remember his name. I won't out him, but <laughs> you, should, sure. you should look him He's up. Like you still should look Working at the camp is probably yeah. what's happening. But yeah, still firing like teenagers. Yeah, I'm I'm still proud of being fired from that job. And as someone that does what we do now and reserving secrecy, especially when it comes to matters of the body, the female body, then yeah. absolutely go fuck yourself. Yes, go integrity. <laughs> I guess I feel like we've we've talked so much about what's to come. So we might as well just get into the episode. But before we do quick announcements at Datable Podcast, that's our Instagram, TikTok. You could find us on all the socials and love of the time of Corona is the Datable Facebook group. So join us there. Make sure to subscribe and to also listen on Sundays for Brunch Talk. We've gotten some really good feedback on the Brunch Talk episodes, so we will continue doing that. If you have a question that you want answered, feel free to DM us on Instagram or hello at datablepodcast.com. Yes. Okay, before we get into it, let's hear a message from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Aurelia. We are excited to pamper ourselves with some high quality lingerie. Yay! Oh my God, I could not wait to open my box. <laughs> I know. Well, Aurelia is a premium curated lingerie and sleepwear subscription box with 100% five out of five client ratings. Yeah, and I love that you filled out a style quiz about your sizes and preferences, Mm. and then a dedicated stylist curated two to three pieces of lingerie or sleepwear per box. How fun is it having beautiful lingerie delivered to your doorstep? And I'm loving everything in my box, so it's hard for me to choose a favorite piece. I don't know about you. Same, but I am gravitating to this lace brawn underwear set that's black, that's sexy, but also comfortable. Comfort is key. The set I'm wearing at night now, it's this floral cami and short set. It's very light. It's perfect for the summer. And it is, oh my God, comfortable. And shipping's free for the US, UK, and Canada, not to mention Aurelia is owned by a beautiful and fabulous woman of color. For a limited time, Dateable listeners get 10% off their first monthly or seasonal box. Yes, just enter the code Dateable10 at checkout. Go to AureliaBox.com. That's Aurelia, A-U-R-E-L-I-A, Box.com and enter the code Dateable10 for 10% off. This episode is made possible by The Unmatchmakers, a book by Jackie Lau. From the author of Donut Fall in Love comes a perfect summer love story set in the forested paradise of Canadian cottage country. They ask the question, can love beat the odds when the odds are two mothers dead set against it? Here's a quick synopsis as told by the protagonist. You think my mother would be trying to set me up with the architect Neil Troy, the unmarried son of her best friend. But you'd be wrong. My single mother has always been fiercely independent. Since I was a small child, she always told me not to believe in fairy tales and that I don't need a man. So she's failed to mention that Neil is a total hottie in glasses. When I see him for the first time in a decade on a multifamily cottage vacation, I'm in for quite a shock. Even though my mind is spinning romantic fantasies, I'm not entirely sure how he feels. And I'm afraid that if anything happens between us, it'll screw up the friendship between our staunchly anti-relationship mothers, especially since they've been acting increasingly weird since we arrived. In fact, I think they're trying to sabotage my love life. And I'm starting to worry that I won't make it through this bizarre summer vacation. End of synopsis. You can read or listen to The Unmatchmakers by Jackie Lau at Kobo.com. That's spelled K-O-B-O or wherever books are sold. Okay, let's hear it from Meredith. A few months ago, we asked for some resident daters who are in the (laughs) thick of dating to do some reporting from the sidelines, if you will, because both (laughs) Julie and I are no longer in the dating scene. And Meredith was basically the first to raise her hand and say, I'll do it. 
I'll be your resident <laughs> dater. We're still figuring out what that looks like, but we figure let's just get Meredith on the show and talk about dating since this is a dating podcast anyway. Yeah. And here we are, our Instagram <laughs> friend, Meredith. How are you? Oh, thank you. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that you said yes, because I have so many people on Instagram that want to talk about dating specifically in your 30s. And so I think this is a great a great forum. Awesome. Oh, I nice. know. It's always so fun to meet people behind the Instagram handle, you know, that we've been interacting with for quite some time. So encourage others to also DM us like Meredith has. Yeah, you're really, a real you person. Real. You respond yeah. and you're real too. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all real people just living, <laughs> figuring this out. We're all humans. Uh, so who is Meredith? She's 34 years old, <laughs> lives in the Inland Empire here in California, originally from Dallas. She's pretty single, uh, been taking a dating sabbatical and actively going on dates. So you're doing both, taking a dating sabbatical <laughs> and going on dates. I said both because it depends on the week. Honestly, uh-huh. if I'm really busy, if I'm really busy with work, life is crazy, or I've got a ton of other, if I'm traveling, you know, sometimes I'm into it, sometimes I'm not. But I really go week by week, you know, how do I want to spend my time this week? Is it dating? Is it not? And I just try to really check in with myself as to be where where I'm at. I mean, so that where is are you such at? a good segue. Yeah. Where are you at? <laughs> I feel badly because when I messaged you, I had so many dates. <laughs> and right now it's a little bit quieter. So I'm in a little bit of a lull. That's okay. And that's, okay. that's kind of how it is, right? Yeah. I, it takes so much time and so much energy and so much effort. And I, you know, I really try to use my time wisely and check in with myself. And if I'm not showing up as my best self in the moment, then I know I need to take a pause, lean way into self-care, do what I want to do, get myself into a place where I'm really feeling good um, and and open and wanting to get to know somebody. So that is one thing I wanted to just talk about of self-care and preservation through the dating process because it can feel so daunting. Mm. But I actually really like dating. I really like getting to know people. I like the dating process. So I have to keep myself grounded and take care of myself so that it's still fun. I was going to ask you that, you know, we talk about relationships, but how would you describe your relationship with modern dating? Uh, uh, love, hate, I guess a lot of people. <laughs> I think a lot of people use that. that. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea of living in a village a long time ago before you had access to online dating and you only had the options in your town of people who set you up, mm-hmm. um, that sounds a little bit limiting to me. So while I know a lot of people romanticize about those old days, for me, I mean, I work in corporate HR, so I'm used to, you know, recruiting and volume and staffing. Mm-hmm. And so I, I see the benefit of the number. You just get exposed to more people that are outside of your normal circle. So I love that aspect of it. I hate the fact that it's starting to make people and I have done it to other people sometimes feel disposable. Yeah. Um, and that that is something that I think about a lot. You know, I have ghosted people. I try not to and I've gotten a lot better about giving feedback. I give feedback at the end of a date right away. I don't want to I don't want to have that pit in my stomach and I don't want anyone else to have that pit in their stomach. So if I'm not feeling it, I just say it right away. Really? I say, hey, yes, I say this was really fun. I enjoyed getting to meet you, but I don't think I'm going to want to take this any further. And if they ask why, I tell them why. I don't want this second guessing and this wondering yeah. or the awkwardness of me. Do How do I respond to their text the next day? I just say it. How do you make it sound so simple? <laughs> you truly are a recruiter. Well, you really are. <laughs> End of the first interview, you're like, we won't be moving forward to the next round. <laughs> and that's So that's probably my problem. Like if you guys were going to diagnose me today. Date like a recruiter. Yeah. <laughs> you would say, hey, you know, Meredith, you got to get out of your HR recruiter mode and you've got to just let some things happen and not Mm. control everything so quickly. So that's something that I'm personally working on. I have a therapist that I work with. And um, I just think, you know, I have a lot an amazing skill set for work that does translate into dating a lot. But sometimes it's too much and I need to turn it off. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you're even aware in the first place is the first step, right? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And maybe sometimes that there's nothing wrong with that, because closing the loop is a good thing instead of leaving people hanging. But maybe taking some of the corporateness out of dating would be good. I would love to know when was your last relationship? My last relationship was in 2019 in Dallas. Okay. 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 And how long was that relationship for? It was one of those on and off, but it was for yeah. about a year and a half. Okay. Well, we've all had one of those, haven't we? <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. I don't, <laughs> don't recommend, but 
Um, for me, it was a great part when I think about relationships and dating history, as far as growth and what I learned from it, Mm -hmm. I I was dating somebody who was very recently divorced and and dealing with that. And there was a child involved and I'm single, never divorced, no kids. You know, I have a cat and, um, I have a lot of hair products and a lot of shoes, but (laughs) other than that, I bring a different (laughs) amount (laughs) of things to the table and I wasn't used to navigating and I wasn't comfortable navigating the every other weekend girlfriend. And that was really, really really hard. And um, I think there were some other complications after therapy related to that one that I've, I've figured out, you know, related to just love languages and um, what are my needs and they just weren't being met. Something that you guys talked about recently, I don't remember which episode, but I remember hearing it and I was like, oh, shoot, I think that's me. You talked <laughs> about um, wanting to win and com- competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I think in some relationships, I just wanted to win versus thinking, is this really the right person for me? Or do I just want them to want? me. You and everyone else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, haven't we all been there? But yeah. so three years ago, I mean, 2019, you were just starting your 30s, dating in your 30s. Yes. And at the top of this episode, you talked about, oh, I speak to a lot of people who are dating in their 30s. How has dating in your 30s been different than your 20s? Oh, my gosh. Well, so I was in a relationship for a very long time in my 20s. So I was with one person from 21 to 27. So experienced a lot wow. of firsts with that person, was living in Boston. It was just a very different life. So I was sort of establishing who I was going to be as an adult and as a you know 20 something young professional in a city. I was establishing myself with somebody, with somebody always in the back of my mind, always someone that I was thinking about. And I made a lot of choices career wise, lifestyle wise, things that I don't think I would have done if I had known myself before I got so enmeshed in this relationship. So when that ended, and it was painful, and it was hard, and it was brutal, and required a a lot of work to get through after. But once that was done, I realized I don't ever want to feel this way again. I felt like I kind of mm. lost myself. Mm. And a lot of people do that and in any age, any relationship. But being single at 27 and saying, hey, I don't know anyone anything like this is my life. And it's going to be it's going to be up to me how I spend my time and where I live and what I do and how much money I make and how much education I get. Like, this is all on me. It made me have a level of a personal accountability that I don't think I ever took before. And I couldn't blame somebody else. Um, yeah. So being in my 30s now in dating, I know who I am. I've I've tried on some different styles of dating. I've tried on some different things. I like to say I tasted the menu, you know, <laughs> <laughs> after being with, you know, one person for that long, I went out and was like, what could this be like? What would this be like? I'm just going to be really, really open and try different things. And that was really fun. And I recommend everybody go through that experience and doing it a little bit later in life, I kind of knew what was for me and what wasn't for me pretty quickly versus waiting five years. I definitely want to get into the tasting the menu. I'm going to sidebar <laughs> that for now because I want to go back there. <laughs> We're not letting that slip away. But <laughs> deal, deal. I think it's interesting because I feel like UA, you had a very similar experience too. And I'm the opposite. Like I definitely was a late bloomer, did not put dating at the forefront in my 20s, all about finding myself. So very opposite. It's an interesting parallel that you two have. The fact that it's almost like you are doing what society tells you to do. You're going through like the more traditional path, right? Mm -hmm. I guess like Meredith, like from your perspective... If you could go back in time, would you do it the same way you did it? Or Ooh. do you feel like you would actually like benefit more from being single earlier? I if I could go back in time and I don't really believe in regret, so I, I don't regret, you know, going through the experience and learning what I learned. But if I were talking to, let's say, one of my nieces now who is kind mm-hmm. of in this situation at a younger, you know, at a different point in life, I would just say that you don't have to do what your parents did and you don't have to mm. do what everyone around you and your church group did or your school did, you really can forge your own path and you're probably going to end up a lot happier than some of the people who maybe haven't or it just may not be for you. So you're going to end up a lot happier by trusting your gut. And if you know something's not right or something's not feeling right and you're not with a partner that can communicate and talk through it, then it's probably better to be single and explore. But, you know, growing up in Texas, people get married really young. People, Mm -hmm. People partner off very young. And so I was off in Boston and I took a lot of my Texas values and the way I was raised to Boston. And I really, and you talk about, I'm kind of a weird mix of the two of you, I think, because I was a late bloomer in that I went to an all girls high school. And then I went Mm. to a mostly gay college. Um, I went to Emerson College where the phrase was gay by May or your money back. I mean, it was really, (laughs) 
It was really <laughs> liberal and it was shocking. <laughs> It was that phrase spit is, out my water. That <laughs> phrase is not it's not on the website, but everybody knew it. Everybody I hope knew it's it. not on the website. It's not the official tagline of the universe. <laughs> that would be incredible Every if it was. Every person though. who hears this who went to Emerson would know that. Like that was just You know, I went to BU and I I'm, okay. I'm nodding my head. So you I, know. I've heard it. You know. Exactly. You know. Okay. So I was a late bloomer and, and I didn't really date a lot in high school. I was always in theater and I was always doing choir and I was just very busy with my friends. Friends and I didn't the only guys I knew were in theater and this weren't really an option. So, you know, I went I went to Boston and I was like, I want to kiss a boy. And then I'm like, I want to date a boy. I want to I want to be in a relationship. And I made all those things happen. And so working mm-hmm. through, you know, what I talked about a little bit earlier about the competition and all of that, did I make this, did I force this relationship into more of something than it really was? Mm-hmm. Uh, and was the person just willing to go along with it until he wasn't? You know, I've had a mm-hmm. lot of time to reflect and think back to what were my pieces of that. And, you know, I wasn't perfect. He really wasn't perfect. But when I first got out of that relationship, I had that blame and that like victim mentality. I know that I went on some dates that I've probably blacked out. But, we, you know, you talk about sampling the menu. <laughs> I went on some dates where I, I, tra- I definitely trauma dumped. I definitely went, woe mm-hmm. is me. And here's my story. And I got cheated on. And this is what happened. Yep. And nobody wants to hear that when they want to date you. <laughs> no man wants to hear that ever, really. It's not a therapy Def- session. Def- no. Definitely not no. on the first date. And so even like back to the 2019 relationship, you know, I kind of highlined the top key points as we got more serious that he needed to know and kind of what, what I learned from that. But I never, I haven't trauma dumped since. And it's it just took me time and, and figuring out of, oh, this didn't land well. <laughs> This didn't. This didn't. <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of like a like a, a stand up comedian trying like a stand-up new material. Comedian, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, this didn't land well. <laughs> that didn't get the reaction yeah. I wanted. Why? I wonder why. So I want to talk about cheating. Oh, so I feel like cheating is a big one. Yeah. How do you think, I mean, obviously cheating is never a fun experience. I don't think anyone will say that regardless of your stance on cheating. How do you think this impacted you moving out of this relationship and dating in the future? I It made it so hard. It made it really hard for me to trust anyone. It made me just doubt people's intentions. Uh, it also definitely hit my self-esteem. So, you know, part of my whole Instagram journey, my Instagram is just my personal Instagram that I I was posting on. I never had the intent of trying to make it something or become an influencer. That wasn't even a word that was used when I was posting. So we're talking um, January of 2015 is when I moved back to Dallas. And I just wanted to figure myself out and and kind of reclaim my life. But my confidence was at an all time low. And I didn't I, I thought I was unworthy of love and unworthy of commitment. And I mean, things thoughts like that still creep in. But but I've I've managed to find worth completely apart from anybody else's perspective of me or anyone else's time commitment in me or investment in me. So that I've been able to work through. But it's still, I mean, it's a deal breaker for me. It's not something that I can get over. It's because it comes down to trust. It's not even the act of of the cheating. It's the trust and the the relationship. When did the cheating happen? Um, I don't really know when it started, but I found out about it in December of 2014. Okay, so this is the long-term boy. Boyfriend, yes, yes. So as far as I know, this is the only person who's ever cheated on me. I mean, <laughs> that I'm confirmed of, <laughs> for sure. We'll, we'll say that. We'll put it that way. But yes, this was the long term. And was that what ended it? That was it. Yeah, that was it okay. for me. But you know, after a lot of therapy and, and time and spent journaling and traveling and working on myself, the end was in sight. The end had already been coming. There were a lot of indicators that I just either didn't want to pick up on or wasn't mm. experienced in relationships to know that like this is more than somebody kind of acting out or being distant or you know there's something there's something more here and and I can't I can't quite grasp it and I didn't know what it was I had a friend who had recently experienced something like this and I was talking to her and I kind of thought we were maybe getting engaged my parents were coming for Christmas mm. my brother and his wife had just gotten married wow. they're younger like I really thought maybe he's being weird cuz he's getting engaged or we're getting mm. engaged and he's just having you know all that emotion and maybe he's being distant because 
because he got a part-time job and he's saving up money for a ring. You know, my mom, uh-huh. had, my mom has had to tell me since I was a child, life is not a show. Life is not a play, Meredith, because I mm. love theater and I grew up in the theater. And I think, you know, we see these rom-coms and we read these books and we have these unrealistic yes. expectations and we make excuses for people. And if I had cut it off way sooner and just said, hey, now I would just say, hey, you're acting really weird. And consi- right. consistency is really important to me. And you're really inconsistent right now. You're coming home really late. You're not telling me who you're hanging out with. You're flaking on plans. And this is not okay with me. And then that would be it. But instead, it lasted for weeks and, and months and things that went on. And so the friend that had recently been cheated on, she said, hey, you may want to check your phone bill. And I I never wanted Whoa. to check. And I never, I really didn't doubt him. And I hadn't been looking at his stuff. Like I really trusted him after that much time and investment. But I paid for the phone bill. And so I had the account. And so I logged on and I saw a ton of calls and text messages from a number that was out of state. And I confronted him about it. Well, actually, my best friend at the time in Boston, she called the number for me on our lunch break. Oh, my gosh. It it was like a movie, right? We went downstairs. We were at the John Hancock Tower working. We went downstairs. She called the number and said, who's this? And the girl said, who's this? And I mean, she did it for me because I was shaking. Like, I I couldn't speak. I felt like I was going to puke. And he and I worked close by. We worked a couple blocks away from each other. And so she said, uh, you know, I'm dating this person. And my friend said, well, he lives with somebody. He's in a relationship. And that was really it. I don't really remember. I kind of blacked out, but it was a short conversation. So she didn't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. From that conversation, I don't think so. Um, They're married now. Oh, shit. (laughs) So, you know, maybe something amazing came out of it for them. But um, I told him to meet me in Copley Square Plaza and we sat down. I said, you you need to meet me right now. And we sat down and I said, what is this? Like, this is what I know. What, What is happening? And he said, I haven't decided yet. I'll never forget that. He said, I haven't decided what I want to do. Wow. Um, what? Like not apologize. Not really. He looked and guilty. And it's his choice. And I said, yeah. I'll make it really easy for you. And this is a girl who is yeah. who is broken and upset and, and trying to figure out we live together. Like, what am I going to do? We had a dog and a cat and we had travel plans. And, you know, I, I thought we were going to get married. But, you know, when he said that, I didn't even think about it. The first thing I said was, well, I'll make it really mm. easy for you. I'm not an option. So go be with her. Mm-hmm. And he did. <laughs> I wow. mean, like I think that this is living proof. I mean, I'm obvi- we're obviously seeing you and you're, you know, so- seem so happy and vibrant. You can come back yes. from really hard situations. Totally. You totally can. Yeah. And that's probably what a lot of women message me about. And I'm, I'm careful. I don't want to make that my narrative forever going forward. That was so long ago at this point. Um, right. I've really moved on. But I have people that are just now getting divorced and maybe they're in their 30s or 40s or going through a, a significant breakup. And it kind of felt like a divorce. Our lives were very much intertwined. Yeah. And so I can really relate to that woman that's like, hey, I'm starting over and I'm I'm really upset and really sad and I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. I can't see what it looks like on the other side. So thank you for sharing You know what you're going through or what you've been through. Thank you for showing that life does get better. But that if I had a mission, it would be that for sure. There's something very nuanced going on here where I feel like a lot of women that I've spoken to have done this where you feel like I'm not going to say anything, even though something's off, because I feel like there's going to be a big payoff, like a proposal right. or a surprise vacation, or it's my birthday coming up. We intuitively know something is off. And, mm-hmm. and this relationship as is today is not sustainable. But for some reason, we can forego that because we think that this is working towards something big, quote unquote, that doesn't really matter. Like a proposal, proposal from someone who's not right for you is right. not a good thing at all. Right. A proposal <laughs> right. to somebody who lies to you and keeps things from you. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to end well either way. So what are you waiting for? No, I can feel your pain, though, of like when it feels like you've lost yourself yes. in someone because mm-hmm. I definitely have been there before and I think that made it a lot harder to bounce back and when you look at a relationship that you are like I did not state my needs I did what they wanted yeah. like that makes it very hard and I know for myself and I love to hear for about you therapy changed my life and I did that because of that situation in retrospect I probably should have done it a lot earlier than that but sometimes it takes like that type of thing mm-hmm. to push you to get do the work that you need to do. How do you think your life has changed since you've grown from what happened? I feel like 
there are infinite possibilities in my life. I feel like any life that I want for myself, I can make happen. And I felt like with him, a lot of things weren't going to be in the cards for me or weren't going to be possible because of what he wanted or his pre- preferences or his lifestyle. I I feel like I can really lean in to who I am and what I want. You know, you mentioned going to therapy right after. I didn't. I wasn't prepared. I, I couldn't tap into how upset and sad I was. And so I started from the outward in. And I don't think it matters. I think as long as you do something for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I started with fitness and and finding out Mm -hmm. nutrition, things that I actually like to eat after living a life of diet culture where I felt like guilty for eating a salad with breaded chicken, right? Like I just, I had a lot Mm -hmm. of internal stuff that I had to work on, um, but I couldn't tap into it until I started somewhere. And so for me, that was, I went to senior citizens yoga classes because I was unemployed and it was really cheap. Um, (laughs) I I mean, I moved, I... (laughs) I did chair yoga with a bunch of ladies in their, you know, 70s and 80s because it was almost free. Um, I walked, I started walking, you know, I remember that I love nature and I, I love hiking and I love the outdoors and the person that I was with, you know, liked drinking in the outdoors, but didn't really like the outdoors that I like. And so I just started Mm -hmm. leaning into those things and those activities. And then honestly, I didn't end up starting to go to therapy until after the relationship in 2019. I was like, I need to talk to somebody because. I don't want to keep repeating the same patterns and I'm I'm yeah. I'm too old. I've gone through too many things to keep living the same thing with different people. And so even though the relationships were different, there were still some things attachment style wise. You talk about attachment styles and um, love languages and and just communication and, and clarity and I just needed help. So finally because I did all of that external stuff, like I went and I got my MBA, I got a certificate. I did all the kind mm-hmm. of the the stuff and the things and then I was still staring at myself at the end of the day and realized I needed to go deal with some of that internal stuff. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that stuff's valid though, too, because you built a life, right? And I think- I did. I mean, that's so big, especially if you're unraveling out of a shared life that was not your own. So I totally get in your circumstance why you went that route first. And I think that actually is something beautiful that can come from a breakup also. Totally. And even the, the whole Instagram thing, I was just trying to figure out my style. I had gotten into a rut of Boston and leggings and dark tunic and jackets. And I I didn't even know, you know, I was always commuting on a train and I showed up looking disheveled and sweaty anyway, no matter what I wore. So I felt, you know, I'm in Texas, I can show up in air conditioned and I can wear heels. Like I want to figure out what I, what I like to wear and what colors I like and what styles I want to, I want to play. And that was before any weight loss, any physical transformation. Like I wanted to celebrate my body as it was and figure out my style. I love hearing that because I think in the similar relationship I was in in my 20s from 22 to 27, I latched my identity to this relationship to the point where I couldn't, sometimes you need to step out of the situation to see it for what it is. And I never was able to step out of it, not until when I was 27 and was getting out of this relationship. I had this moment of who the fuck am I? (laughs) You know, like, who am I? If I were to describe myself and what my personality is and my passions, my hobbies, I don't know because these were all shared hobbies, interests, shared friends, shared restaurants. And it was so exciting to reacquaint with myself and to meet myself again. It's a very scary thing too. And it sounds like you also went through that. It's like, ooh, let's see see where this ends up. But it's so exciting. (laughs) Yes, I physically packed my bags and I moved back to Texas and my parents took me in. I moved in with my parents and I just had some time to sort of reframe, reset, refocus my whole life. And I started with working out and my career and eventually led to the internal work and what kind of mark I want to leave on this world. You know, it's, it's been, it's been truly amazing. And so I went from, you know, I was crying a lot and not really getting out of bed and, you know, talking, I had to talk through things with my parents and bless my parents. They're my best friends. They listened and they listened and they listened and they just took such great care of me, but they also pushed me and encouraged me to take this time for myself and to, to do the things that I'd always dreamt that I could do or wanted to do. So, and not everybody has that. And I, I know what kind of privilege that is to be able to go home and reset. And I'm just, I'm so grateful for that. But my life is so much more full now. And I don't have resentment inside me anymore. I really don't. And I, I, I really, I wish my ex well with this person. I, I Mm -hmm. don't talk to him and wouldn't and have no need to, but I don't, I don't hate him. I don't wish that he got hit by a bus. You know, I, (laughs) 
<laughs> I've worked I've worked through that and I think that's really that that forgiveness is is so precious yeah. and helps me approach people differently than I, I would have right after. Mm. Let's hold that thought for a few messages. This episode is brought to you by Attitude. Want deep, restful sleep without taking melatonin? Trying to stop your night sweats? Or looking to get a little more eco-friendly? You won't get these with any old cotton sheets, but you will with bamboo. Upgrade your stuffy cotton bedding in Attitude's naturally breathable bedding made from their innovative clean bamboo fabric. It feels unlike anything else you've slept on. And no, they won't cost you or the earth, because right now you can get 20% off your first order by visiting attitude.com slash datable. These unbelievable soft, clean bamboo sheets have over 15,000 five-star reviews, and they've been performance tested to be 51% more durable than standard sheets, 17% better at regulating temperature, and 24% more moisture wicking. I've been sleeping on my Attitude sheets, and in addition to them feeling super soft and comfy, I'm really into the temperature regulating function. Now I no longer wake up in the middle of the night with night sweats. They're so sure you'll love sleeping with them that you can try any Attitude bedding risk-free for 30 nights. If you're not completely satisfied, you can return it for a full refund. Don't forget, you can get 20% off your order plus free shipping for a limited time when you visit edituDe.com slash dateable. That's E-T-T-I-T-U-D-E dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This is Etitude's best offer right now, so don't wait. Order today for free shipping and 20% off your order at edituDe.com slash dateable. Have you ever thought about how much better dating would be if you had a whole army of people supporting you along the way. We know that dating can be frustrating and lonely, but it can also feel fulfilling and fun. Have you recently decided you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're just ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes monthly office hours where you can drop in and chat with us about anything, weekly sound sound offs with guided discussions and regular virtual happy hours. Allow Julie and I to become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can all navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. So I told you I wasn't going to forget about this, but I want to talk <laughs> about the sampling the menu because that's the other part of you know, emerging into your new self to start dating. Yeah, oh my tell gosh. us all. <laughs> well, okay. So I think I probably come off as a little bit goody goody, right? I work in corporate HR. I grew up in the South, right? But I never quite figured out like who was my type. You know, you talk about types. I didn't really have mm. one. Like I just like people that made me laugh. And I still like people that make me laugh. That's still something that I, I find attractive. You know, you talk about the types and I'm probably still doing it a little bit now that I moved close to LA because there are types that maybe I never would have had exposure to. So it's a season <laughs> of life. It comes and it goes. But yeah, I got on all the dating apps and I tasted the menu. I thought, you know, I'm going to try to date someone who's divorced with kids, someone without kids. I'm going to date an accountant. I'm going to date a lawyer. I'm going to date a bro, a frat bro who hasn't grown up yet. Um, I'm going to date a musician. I'm going <laughs> to- Plenty of oh, those. <laughs> there's so many. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's been a while since I've like gone back to that, that sample of tasting the menu. Menu. So I'd have to really, oh, I actually, I dated a guy from high school that I'd always had a crush on. We actually dated on and off for a little bit. Like I, I, w I went back wow. and, and checked that out and experienced that for what that was. <laughs> and he was darling and sweet and very attentive and, and a very good, uh, I won't say rebound, but like a safe place, a safe place to date after going through what I went through, but not someone to carry on into the future. And he would say that as well. We just had very, I was just super driven and he was at a more relaxed pace. So, um, but that was really great uh, just to try different, different experiences out. And I mean, even now being an hour and a half from LA, I have dated a drummer. I've gone out with an actor, you know, <laughs> there's an entertainment lawyer, there's a comedian lurking. Like it's, um, it, it's less, I used to be so specific about what I thought I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I've realized that as I've met my own needs, I've become much more open to the types of people that I will date because I'm not looking for them to fulfill something 
that I haven't done for myself. What I love about you, and we talk about this a lot, is like being intentional, but also open. And what does Mm -hmm. that mean? Because they're all like, you know, vague buzzwords, and it's hard to quantify what that really means. But what you just said, you're dating with such an open mind, but you also know what's important to you. And I think that is, you know, that is like the equation, essentially. Right. Well, I had a friend, and my best friend is my complete opposite. So she, we're the yin to each other's yang. We are so different (laughs) from each other. And I remember one time I told her I wouldn't date a male nurse. And she said, well, that's really rude. Meredith, why would you say that? Like, that's very derogatory. And I said, oh, I wouldn't date a male doctor either. I don't like talk about blood and guts. My mom is a nurse. And I grew up, like, she ruined spaghetti for me for many years because of dinner conversation. Like, (laughs) it just wasn't for me. And I mean, I could date someone in the medical field who didn't talk graphically, you know, but but she thought, you know, she was thinking she was kind of saying, hey, Meredith, you're putting someone out of a category for not a really good reason. But then when I told her my reason, she said, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. And then what do you think about, uh, I can hear some of our listeners saying, well, I want to be open minded. But at what point do you say I need to narrow down my preferences? (laughs) Because if you're so open all the time, sometimes you could get lost in that sea of samples Mm -hmm. and just say, whatever, (laughs) whatever goes. Right. I mean, I used to say I'll go out on a first date with pretty much anyone because it's very low stakes. You're having, you know, having a coffee, having a beer, you know, something very quick, casual. It doesn't have to take that long. And for me, I try to think of it as like, I'm going to experience something new. I'm going to go to a place I've never been, Mm -hmm. or I'm going to get a a cup of coffee at a place I've heard about. So I try to make it a a combo. So at least something was a win, even if the date was a bust, I at least tried something I wanted to try. But for me, I have to reel it in, right? I only have so much time and so much energy. And so I, I, I have, you know, listened to some of the things you guys have recommended. Uh, And during the pandemic, especially, it was a great way to weed people out from the volume to do a video chat or do a voice call before a first date just to see is there conversational chemistry. Because if there's not over the phone or in a video chat for me, it's not going to happen in person. That conversational chemistry, Mm. I can talk to a brick wall. So if I can't talk to you, right, (laughs) there's just no point in wasting the gas money in today's economy. So I, I narrow it down that way a lot. I mean, I am very open. And I think being 34, you're in that weird range where there's all the memes about you could date the person or you could date their dad. <laughs> it's really true. So I try to keep my age, <laughs> I try to keep my age settings really open because age, you know, age doesn't necessarily account for experience and somebody's core and who somebody is. Now, have I been on a date with a 24 year old recently and a 52 year old? Yes. 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 And yes. yes. <laughs> were they're not, were there a lot of differences? No. Men are kind of the same. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had all these expectations. I think the 24-year-old was probably a little more mature. So you just don't know. So I think with the the apps and the settings, like you've just got to keep them pretty wide open, but then do the, the mm, weeding yeah. out as you have the conversations. And that's where a lot of people get burned or get tired or exhausted. Mm-hmm. I have a pretty standard opening combo. And I what, it doesn't matter what app it is. I'll reach out first. If I'm interested, I'll start the conversation. It doesn't Good. cost me anything. It's free. It takes two seconds. If they don't respond well or they don't respond, then okay, we swipe them off and we keep going down the queue. Like there's really no harm. So yeah. I would hate to miss somebody because they're shy because I probably should be with someone a little yeah. more introverted to balance me right. out. Those are the right. best people. The non flashy people exactly. are the best people. Right, on right. The and so in our Instagram worthy, you know, life that we're we're leading, I think you've got to be so careful. I actually look for the profiles that are not as sparkly or perfect. Yes. I love a, a guy with some oh, yeah. bad photos. Same. Yeah. Where they're all like a little yeah. bit blurry or he's got a bunch of, you can tell that he has friends. Yeah. Worse, you can tell that better. he has friends. You can tell it hasn't <laughs> yeah. been curated. Not not linked no, to his Instagram. No, follow me on Snapchat no. or Instagram or any of those things. Yeah. I think that's really important because we I mean, we talk about the, this a lot. You, there's no way you can learn anything from a 2D Absolute, profile photo. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. Profile. And I've made there's the mistake no of thinking you know someone based on a couple pictures and a couple lines. And you really don't. They're still a stranger. And, you know, I, I I think because of my age or just generation timeline, I've done a lot of app dating. Like it has been a pretty easy way for me to 
meet people. However, coming out of the pandemic, my personal goal for myself is to meet more people in person, especially moving to California. I don't know anybody. The the app thing, me not knowing anyone and not knowing who they know, I just feel like it would be better to meet someone with a little bit of common ground. So I've been joining the meetups, which mm. haven't met anyone that I'd want to date from a meetup, but I still have joined them. I went to a, um, there's one in Los Angeles for people who love free concerts. And so there was like a, har- a symphony concert and, you know, just kind of meeting people. You never know who knows somebody. That's the HR networker in me yeah. is like, mm-hmm. there may be absolutely Definitely. no one at the event that I'm interested, in, but I could make a friendship and they could have a group of friends that they could introduce me to. Yeah. So I do try to stay open in that way. And, you know, the whole picking up people at bars thing, have I done it? Sure. <laughs> is it is it usually, you know, a great foundation for a, a lasting relationship? Probably not. <laughs> I'm still single. But, but, the, yeah. but for me, even having that confidence to approach someone or have them approach me and engage in a yeah. conversation, yes. that's a win for me because growing up and after my relationship in my 20s, I would have been so terrified and so insecure that I wouldn't have been able to even engage in that way. And now I'm like, yeah, let's have a conversation. Who knows who you are? I went to a brewery by myself a couple of weeks ago. I had lunch with a friend and I was in a new area and I said, hey, I've got some work that I want to do. I'm doing some writing. I want to go sit at a brewery and just you know, be in a different space than my apartment, get out of the house. And so she recommended a brewery and I went and there were these two guys next to me. And so they follow me on Inst- they follow me on Instagram now, but they they were uh-huh. sorry, <laughs> nice. I gotta be careful what I say. But they were sitting next to me and I overheard their conversation because I'm a I'm an observer of people. Like my background is theater. I'm always observing people. I love to listen. I love to see people's mannerisms and just kind of figure out what the story is, right? So I'm sip- sipping my beer, have my journal. I sort of am in and out of their conversation. It seems like they're both partnered. It seems like they're both partnered and in serious relationships. And they uh-huh. were talking about missing the chase and the fun of the chase. Mm. And it was it was such really? an elevated conversation for two seemingly bros at a brewery that I was like, huh, that's really interesting. <laughs> and then I toned them out. I tuned them out and I started working on what I was working on. And I was drinking my beer and I was writing and I finished my beer and they were looking right at me. And one of them said, we need to know what you're writing about. I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually working on some song lyrics. I've never written a song before, but I just feel like I have them in me. So I thought I'd try. And so we started having this amazing conversation and they weren't hitting on me and they offered to buy me another beer. And we sat down and we had a really nice conversation and we talked about where they were at in life. And it was such a nice moment of like, hey, I'm connecting with two people. It doesn't feel creepy. It's not gross. You know, maybe they had a little crush on me. I mean, you can't blame them. Uh, Did I I think they were attractive? Yes. But were they both partnered? Yes. And they made that clear. So it wasn't like that. It was just like a really normal, healthy, cool conversation about life and where we're at. They were both in their late 20s, both with people they'd been with for a long time. One wasn't quite sure, Mm. but he has a baby with the person. And, you know, I mean, it was, yeah, it was on the edge of therapy, right? So I had to kind of stop him at some point and be like, thank you for the beer. I'm going back to writing. (laughs) Or that's a hundred more (laughs) beers, please. Not in that agreement. But like, I wonder what they talked about on the way home together. And it was just a nice, normal, like, hey, we're just, this is a random check-in with two strangers I'll probably never see. See again, but you know, never you never know. Maybe they have friends, and maybe it could have become something. But that wasn't the vibe. Mm-hmm. But just that comfort. It's so crazy that this is like a unique situation. You know? know, the fact that this isn't what happens. People are so results oriented. It's always like, is this person hitting on me, or could they be something? We just don't connect and have these types of conversations anymore. Well, and I we haven't talked about it, but that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons I love solo travel because I feel like in other places I've traveled in other countries, yeah. it's more like the experience that I just experienced where people want to get to, they're like, huh, you're by yourself. What are you doing here? Let's talk about your trips. Let's talk about mm-hmm. travel. Let me tell you where you should go to dinner. Hey, come with us. We're going to dinner. It's just a very different experience in the countries that I visited. And America hasn't felt like that. America is very protective, very closed off. Um, everyone's yeah. in their own bubble doing their own thing. Or if they're alone, they're on their phones. And so I really do try to make it a point when yes. I travel and I go out to dinner, I have my phone with me, but I don't pick it up or I'll maybe pick it up once or twice, but I'm not going to sit on my phone. It's even better to read or write or just look around and talk to people. It's amazing the connection that you can make with people, but it's not common here. 
Mm-hmm. No, I think the other piece too is like, even if it doesn't lead to a date, it changes how you converse with people and connect with yeah. people. So you can bring that later on. We hear all the time, you know, people that really struggle with forming any sort of emotional connection right. on a date. I guess for people like that, since you clearly do not seem to have that problem, <laughs> what advice or thoughts would you have for them? I would just say that every person that you meet remember that they have value, Mm -hmm. whether it's value that you can see or that you will ever see, maybe not, but everybody has value and has a piece to play or a part to play in this this life that we're living. And and I think not looking at people as transactional, you know, to bring it back to the whole swiping and the dating thing, you know, you think, oh, this didn't go well. There's 10 more people that want to go out with me. Well, when you're in person and you're connecting with people in person, I think it's a lot easier to recognize the humanity and the story and one to know the story, yes. get curious about who they are and what makes them what makes them who they are. That is such an amazing moment to pause and just be grateful for where we're at when the world seems like it's on fire and there are a lot of terrible things that are happening. Humanity is still really real. And when you recognize the value and the connection that people can have, it doesn't have to be transactional. That You don't have to get anything out of it. A free drink, yeah. a date, you don't have to be there for anything else but, but to connect. For someone who's done so much self-work and you're on this journey to feeling strong in your own life and in your own skin, how do you find someone who's on the same wavelength? Because we've gotten Mm -hmm. this kind of question from some of our listeners is I've done all this work and I feel really Mm -hmm. good about myself, but I also need a partner who's on a similar journey as me. Have you found ways that you can vet for that? I mean, I haven't found a lot of volume in that area. So I don't claim to be, (laughs) you know, the person that has all the answers. But I think not feeling guilty for setting your standards high and holding yourself to a high standard. There's this song that I've been listening to and I it's it just popped into my head. Have you guys heard it? I think it's called Anybody. And it's like, uh, I set my standards high, but I could maybe drop them down for the night (laughs) if the vibe is right. (laughs) It just it just hit, that just literally came through my brainwave. Totally uh, not exactly what I was thinking. But so my therapist, something that I've worked with is my therapist. And this was my therapist back in Texas. And I just, I adored her. But, you know, she she talked about society and, and where we are as society as a pyramid. And, you know, I always felt a little bit uncomfortable because she would say, you're near the top of the pyramid. Like you've really worked on yourself and you hold yourself accountable. There's a, a whole bunch of society who take mm-hmm. no accountability for their their actions or how they treat people or what they say. You care about society as a whole. You volunteer. You want to make the world a better place. Like your job is aligned to making it the employee experience really strong and making sure people feel safe and secure. So like your level of standard of human interaction and connection and engagement is really high. And so you're looking for the top of the pyramid and it's smaller at the top. It's just the way a pyramid works. So there's not yeah. as much volume. So you have to be okay with either, you know, taking taking a moment and saying, hey, I'm going to be on a pause until I find somebody else who's near this level. Or, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm going to dip down and be like, hey, my expectations aren't that somebody meets exactly what I've done or is on the same level. I'm okay with that. And that's not settling necessarily. It's just deciding that you're okay with a a difference um, in connection there. So I I don't have the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as like finding men, I mean, go to Home Depot, go to O'Reilly Auto Parts. I was at (laughs) O'Reilly Auto Parts and um, I could have had 10 numbers yesterday and I was straight from work sweaty. I did not look cute, but every man was like, hello, hello, how can I help you? So that was a really good uh, ego boost. But if you're looking for volume, um, but if you're looking for quality, you know, for <laughs> love the tactical advice. I, I mean, I Home Depot, O'Reilly's oh, got it. it. Check. It. Yeah. Get your, yeah. Get a blowout and just like go have, have fun. That's what I would do. <laughs> if I was needing. Get your car yes, fixed. Yes, exactly. Get those windshield wipers replaced. Um, but but no, as, as far as like that level of what I'm looking for. So I mean, I, it's this is so silly, but I got on the Raya app when I got here, which mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh my gosh, you got on. How'd you get on? I, I just applied and, and then I got on. Um, <laughs> You're like, it's not as selective as I, you I, think. I mean, I, I applied and then like four or five months later, they said, You're in. And I said, Great. And then okay. I got on. And it's a lot of male models and celebrities. And so, whereas I thought maybe, oh, this is the 
cream of the crop. This is also men who are like very solid in their careers and go-getters. It's not what I expected. So Mm -hmm. I will not be getting a Raya sponsorship and I actually will not be renewing my membership because it's (laughs) just kind of like, I could just go on Instagram (laughs) if I wanted to look at Instagram male models. (laughs) Well, I think you bring up a good point though. What is the cream of the crop? I think so often, you know, like we think like, especially we've heard this before. It's like, well, I have an MBA. I need someone that has an MBA. Yeah. But someone can show up in a different way that's adding value that puts them at that top of that pyramid also, right? I have an MBA and I specifically don't really want to date somebody with an MBA. I actually, yeah. it's, it's not about, for me, it's not about career. It's not about levels. Do they have a place that they go, that they get paid, like a job? And do they like it? Do they enjoy it? I don't yeah. want to be with someone mm-hmm. who's complaining about their job 24-7. I hear people complain all day at work. When I get home, I want someone who's genuinely yes. pretty happy yes. with what they do. And if that means they're a mechanic, yeah. then great. They can fix my car. And I think that's a really sexy skill to have. I, I make plenty enough money to take care of myself. And I, I can also, I feel like I have high income potential and, and will be fine. But like, I want someone that likes what they do, that feels like they add value to the world. Yeah. Someone who's a teacher. So uh, integrity, integrity and consistency are the two things that I'm looking for the most in a partner. And so that I have been able to narrow down. Now, is that on an app or is that really easy to find right away surface level? No. Um, So I have to talk about it. I'm talking about it here right now with you guys. Maybe someone knows somebody Mm -hmm. and that's part of the reason I thought I'd pitch myself because your listeners are are, are so engaged. (laughs) Hey, they're They're at the the top of the pyramid. They're the cream of the crop. They are. (laughs) Yeah. They're at the tip. Yeah. (laughs) That's a really, I love what you said though, Meredith, because that is the perfect example of being intentional and open at the same time. That you have these two things that you are unwilling to compromise on because heck, that's super freaking important in a long-term relationship. But you don't, you're not prescribed to a certain package of how it shows up. Not at all. Not at all. I'm very open. And I mean, yeah, someone that I find attractive. And and that's not necessarily what everyone would think, right? It's attraction for me is a good smile, twinkling eyes, um, you know, someone, you know, who has a great laugh, um, someone who has confidence in who he is. Um, those are things that I find very attractive. But when I first started dating and I was kind of going off the rails a little bit and I thought tasting the menu, my mom made me make a mm-hmm. list and she was like, Meredith, this is getting ridiculous. I can't keep track of who's who. Like this is, this is, this is too much. And she said, make a list of 10 things and just like core values, things you're yeah. looking for. And if they don't meet, let's say passing grade, seven of those things, you don't need to keep dating them. Like once you find out that they're not meeting those things and we're yep. talking core values, here, nothing like physical, Mm -hmm. Um, then don't keep dating them because I don't want to keep trying to remember who's who. And it was really about her. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Mm. No, she was looking, she was looking, she (laughs) was looking out for me and that was really great. And then my therapist has made me make a list of 50 questions, 50 questions to know about somebody before moving into a serious relationship with them. And, and Mm. it's not like, oh, I have 50 questions to ask you, but it's like, hey, maybe on a third date, I'm going to go in, I'm going to look at my questions and I'm going to try to ask two or, or get to two of the top. And just slowly chip away so that I don't end up in a relationship with somebody who I don't really know. And I don't end up losing myself. That happens all the time. You're a therapist and your mom are very smart They're they're amazing. You know, we we had this on an episode. We had something very similar. Those only seven things that matter. They're not superficial qualities too. And, you know, I think that it's important to take that gut check. We are not all about lists, but if you have no North Star and no gut check, then you're just going Right, and blindly, then you get lost right? or overwhelmed. Yeah. And so here's the other dilemma that I can see our listeners asking too, is like, what if you get too comfortable being alone because you're so happy, you're meeting your own needs, and it's harder to allow someone else into your life? Have you thought about that? I have. That? And I do worry sometimes that I'm getting so good at being alone that I don't have a need for a man, but I still have a want. And I do feel like I'm still going to have mm-hmm. that want. That's not going to go away. But have I opened myself up to thinking about it looking differently than it could have looked? What what partnership could look like? Yeah. Yes. Now I'm not as crazy mm-hmm. as some of your people that you've had on, like as far as openness. Like I, I, I'm not sharing. I don't share. I will not share. I, okay. I, can, I can't even find one person that I like. I'm not going to find multiple. Like I just, I, I'm a, I'm a one, I'm a one man gal. Yeah, Fair it's enough. not for me. I respect it and others and think that's amazingly, but I'm just, I'm just not there. But you know, sometimes I wonder, like, could I meet someone who's a little bit older and more established, and he has his own place, and I have my own place, and we never cohabitate or we never get married. 
married, but we're Mm -hmm. long-term partners. And what could that look like? I mean, I Mm -hmm. love my space. Like ideally I'd have a townhouse and he'd have half and I'd have the other half. Like like that would be my dream. (laughs) You don't have to always sleep together unless we want to, or we can spend time together, but then sleep separately. And if he snores, it won't matter. If I snore, it won't matter. You know, if his kitchen hygiene is not my level of kitchen hygiene, we don't have to fight about it. We'll just have dinner at my place, right? So I mean, I've thought about that, you know, but then also I think about, I kind of do want to share a place with somebody. I kind of do want to go to the farmer's market and come back and cook together in our place. It's our place. And and with mm-hmm. the right person, it'll all work out and the 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 future will will work out the way it's supposed to work out. But um, I think for me, you know, the, the it's the need versus the want. I don't need somebody anymore. I felt like I needed somebody at that time in my life and I needed someone to help guide me because the world was scary and I was living in a city where I didn't have a lot of people. And um, now I'm in a state yeah. where I don't know anybody. I just came out for work completely alone and people message me all the time. I was at dinner. So every, I'm backtrack. I'm, I'm working a ton while I'm here Monday through Friday. On the weekends, I try to take a road trip and go explore some, some part of California um, because it's amazing and it's stupid expensive. And while I'm mm-hmm. here and paying the taxes, I might as well go enjoy it <laughs> and, and explore it. <laughs> yep. And I love to explore. So I went to Santa Barbara and Ojai this weekend for a day trip by myself. Love I did a, um, an amazing hike to a waterfall in the morning. And then I went down to Santa Barbara and I was eating my favorite dish, which is a, a poke, some sort of poke deal. Um, mm. And this woman came by, this woman who was probably in her 60s, 70s. And she came up to me and she just said, you are so confident. I, you seem so comfortable and so <laughs> confident yeah. and calm and relaxed eating by yourself. And she was kind of like a question. And yeah. I said, I am. And she's like, I love that. And I said, I actually moved here by myself. I, I moved across the country by myself. I do a lot of things. I travel the world by myself. So eating dinner is <laughs> this is nothing. And I mean, her, her face <laughs> yeah. was just like, wow. But but that's she's like good for good good for you and um so so I yeah. think you know I, it's not that I can't accommodate somebody else or wouldn't but they're gonna have to be amazing yeah. because my standard of living solo is mm-hmm. so great I'm not gonna put up with someone who's inconsistent or flaky or lies mm-hmm. but I actually think that's the best place to be be coming from and really you know is. I definitely was there myself too and you know as example like you can get past it right when the right person comes in but like you said you're more discerning of who that person is because you don't need it anymore. I feel like, Julie, you haven't talked enough about this. And I don't know if you can add this to the podcast. But as a listener, <laughs> I really want to know, like, what was it about your current partner that made you go like, this is it? This is really I'm gonna I'm gonna go mm. deep in, in on this one. Yeah, let's get there. <laughs> I think it was a lot of these qualities. I mean, we've obviously talked to all these daters. You and I have been doing, you know, this research essentially and taking it in for so long that I realized I was focused on the wrong things Mm -hmm. for so long. And, you know, certain things like consistency. So when you say that, it definitely rings for me. Mm. And I would describe myself as an anxious dater before. And we did this exercise with Dr. Abigail Lev that like changed my my life. And it basically like, I don't know if you remember yes, her from the yes. schemas episode, but we basically she said, whatever your like biggest schemas are, are your core needs in a relationship, you know, fear of abandonment was a big one for me. So finding someone consistent was mm. so essential. And you know, I think too, in dating, so often we get wrapped up in like a fun date and a good experience, but right. that is not life. No. So just having someone that you can talk to. And you know, my current partner, we just never stop talking. We always say that, like we never stop talking. And I just genuinely enjoyed myself with him. And, you know, I think I saw a lot of these qualities that were much deeper than maybe in the past. I was looking for someone that was more life of the party or in the social scene, like things that ultimately do not matter in the long haul. So, I mean, I think a big part of it, though, was getting clear on that stuff. Until you're clear, I don't know. Maybe it's a good segue to takeaways. Like, I feel like until you're clear and unapologetically yourself, that's when things fall into place and you one, realize what you need, not just take things kind of more reactively. I think I was so reactive in so much of my life too, of just dating people that wanted to date me opposed to being like, oh, this is what I'm looking for. And Meredith, I think in your story, it's a really good, you know, what the takeaway I have is it doesn't matter what your past relationship experience is. If you, you know, came from a world where you had no identity because you were intertwined with someone else, or you're coming 
coming from a position where you've had no relationship experience and you've only been on your own. Either way, as long as you bring what makes you you to a partnership and not hold back, that's when you're going to have a healthy long-term partner. So I, I love from this conversation, like so often people get stuck in what's going wrong in dating. And this doesn't mean that you never have a moment, Meredith, I'm sure that you're it is I did too. It's just like, oh my God, this is so frustrating, right? We all have those moments. But overall, your energy and mentality is so positive and, mm-hmm. you know, so energetic. And like, I'm like, been thinking, I'm like, I wish I had someone in the like area that I could set <laughs> Meredith up with, you know, because I'm thinking you just like, you bring like vibrancy. And I think like when you bring that, that is like the most important thing you can do in dating. Like, you can update your profile all day long, but it doesn't matter. And so often we try to focus on this stuff that simply doesn't matter in opposed to looking at ourselves and what we can, how we can grow from dating. Yeah, your energy is just contagious. I am inspired. (laughs) I am, I am energized. I feel so good about this conversation because I think this conversation gives hope to everyone out there, including myself who is in a relationship, but I have to constantly remind myself that I don't need to be in a relationship. I Mm -hmm. choose and want to be in a relationship. And I think you differentiating between need and want is so key here. And I hope people are listening to this is that when you can fulfill all of your needs, all that's left is for your wants. I want to be with someone. I want a partner. I want this in my life. Or maybe I just don't need a partner. I don't want a relationship. Whatever that want is, is, it's just the extra. It's the bonus because you've already filled everything for yourself. And when you don't need a partner, when you don't need a relationship, it makes you less thirsty in dating. It makes you less burnt out in dating because it's just an extra bonus for you at this point. It's not a livelihood, you know, of of being in a relationship. And I I really feel like you bring Meredith. I feel like I'm on a uh, America's Got Talent or something like I'm (laughs) like we're the judging panel. Like Meredith, that was a great performance. Golden buzzer for you. You're dateable. (laughs) Yes, you're very dateable. You're a 10 out of 10. But what it is, what I admire about you is what I aspire to be is that you bring this very distinct flavor to the table. What I mean by this is like, if someone were to bring out the Meredith dish, I can taste it and be like, I know exactly what that is. And I can describe it to other people. There are some dishes that are like, this is a fusion. I'm not sure if I'm getting all the flavor profiles. You are just so distinct in who you are that it actually makes it easier for me and Julie Mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of uh, talk about you with some of our single guy (laughs) friends because we know exactly how to talk about you. But you just, you know yourself so well that it makes me confident knowing who you are and how I talk about you. Well, thank you. That's amazing. That's that's such a huge compliment. And I was just thinking, I'm thinking back to the pandemic because that relationship that I was in ended in 2019 and then the pandemic started and I was getting my MBA and I had told myself, hey, when you're done with your MBA, because I was working full time in school and I thought, you know, 2020 is the year I'm really going to date. And then 2020 happened. And so finding your podcast and finding the community and just knowing that there were other people out there who were experiencing it and the pandemic dating wasn't great, had some weird video chats, like really not a lot to say there. (laughs) You know, as like another takeaway, and I I definitely feel like this round of dating, you asked me earlier, like, what was different? I didn't hold back anything. Mm. And I feel like I hadn't done that as much in the past. I was similar to you, Meredith, that I was like, I'm happy as I am. So I'm just gonna put, put it out there. If it sticks, great. And if it doesn't, I'm still good. Mm -hmm. And I think in that situation, you may quote unquote get rejected more because you're really putting yourself out there. Like UA said, you're not this fusion that people kind of adapt everyone likes. But I do believe when you do meet that person that can see the value, then it will become a no brainer for them. Yeah. And I think that's the benefit of being yourself is that who really wants all these people that like lukewarm stick? You want someone that's like all about it. I think so. (laughs) So Meredith, if people want to check out your Instagram content, where can they find you? I'm Meredith TX. I'll always be Meredith TX. So they can find me yeah. very easily no matter where I live. I'm from <laughs> Texas. So easy to find. Um, definitely mostly on Instagram. I'm trying the TikTok thing, but I still feel ancient. So still figuring that out. Same. Yeah, <laughs> we feel the same way. We definitely look forward to keeping in touch with you on your dating journey. Oh, thank you. And 
but we we will figure out one day what the dating resident expert dater. resident yeah. dating expert means but for now we will continue to stay in touch with you of your journey so thanks again for sharing hopefully this was inspirational and uplifting for people to just keep going thank you for having me it was so nice to meet y'all and to see you in person and you know I have really enjoyed the podcast as a listener and I really like the brunch talk that's my favorite thing Yay. on Sundays like while I meal prep or I, <laughs> I clean I turn on I turn on brunch talk and it's like I'm having brunch with you guys <laughs> well we will get Love brunch one these days IRL <laughs> yes. this is gonna happen uh, what really uplifts this podcast is your ratings and reviews in Apple Podcasts because that's what helps validate our podcast so we can get great guests like Meredith here so the more ratings and reviews we can get in Apple Podcasts the more content we can bring to everyone so we thank you for doing that and thank you Meredith again for being on our show we're gonna wrap this up stay stay <laughs> The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us. We look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Mm-hmm.